Hello and welcome to the Literaturforum in Brechthaus, more precisely to the basement, to another edition of the Jakobiner Club, as the name suggests a cooperation with Jacobin magazine. Tonight's topic will be the cultural scientist and critic of capitalism, Mark Fisher, and his book, Post-Capitalist Desire, the Final Lectures, which was first published in German this year under the title Sehnsucht nach dem Kapitalismus. Matt Cahoon and Alex Brentler will lead the discussion. Adelaide Ivanova, a poet who works at Jacobi magazine, will moderate the discussion. Thank you so much. And something important. Minibar Moralia provides nice cocktails tonight, <laughs> <laughs> such as the Cosmoproletarian, for example. Get your cocktail after the show and pay what you want or what you can. And now, please give our guests uh, a warm round of applause. Hello, is this on, oder? Um, ja, ich muss ein, eine kleine Intro auf Deutsch machen. Um, bear with me. So, wir sind heute im Jakobiner Club. Herzlich willkommen, dass ihr alle da seid. Um, Jakobin Nummer 16 ist vor kurzem raus und um, Vereinigte Märkte von, Euro Märkte von Europa. Es geht um Europawahl. Um, aber der Grund, warum wir heute da sind, ist genau wegen Mark Fischers. Um, oder, no, warte, Moment. Ich bin nervös. Deswegen sind wir heute da, wegen Sehnsucht nach dem Kapitalismus. Ähm, wurde vom Brumaire Verlag dieses Jahr, glaube ich, März veröffentlicht, mit Übersetzungen von Alex Brindler und eine sehr schöne Illustration und Design von Andy King. Ähm, und ähm, ich werde jetzt zu Englisch switchen, Gott sei Dank. And then we uh, can introduce our guests a little bit better. Hello everyone, thanks for coming. Hello. Did I say everything, Ola, that I had to say? <laughs> Thank you. Oof. So, Matt, Matt Colhoun is a writer and photographer from Hull, UK, best known for writing about the late Mark Fisher. Their most recent book, Narcissus in Bloom, was published by Repeater Books in 2023. Currently a PhD candidate in philosophy at Newcastle University. They blog at xenogothic.com. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, Alex Prentler is a writer, translator, and former editor at Jacobin Germany. Uh, we miss you. Um, so before we start, um, we will read, or Matt will read a little bit uh, of the book, uh, and then Alex will also read a little bit of the translation. Right. Okay, is that, yeah, hear me well. Thank you um, for coming tonight and for accommodating me as a stereotypically monolingual Brit. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, I'm going to read um, just the final paragraphs of an introduction, uh, of the introduction to the book um, written a few years ago, um, which may be slightly out of context since it's so short, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, it was certainly not Fisher's intention to publish his thoughts in a form such as this. But at a time when his works are being deployed in service of all manner of projects, there remains no better person to clarify his thoughts than Fisher himself. And it is a thought that certainly requires some clarification. In late 2017, for instance, acid communism was taken up in the UK by a soft left contingent directly linked to the Labour Party, who attempted to further embolden a resurgent democratic socialism by combining it with an entwined rave hippie nostalgia, even going so far as to call for a re-engagement with those aspects of hippiedom that Fisher had always been so suspicious of. Later renamed Acid Corbynism to ground it more firmly in its contemporary movement, this movement did remain loyal to many of Fisher's concerns, such as the need to raise a new collective consciousness that it was also, but it also retained many of the qualities that Fisher saw as detrimental to any resurgent countercultural cause. This movement failed to take into account that central problematic within all of his writings, the crisis of the negative. 
This is to say that collective joy is a superficial salve for an individualized melancholy if neither is capable of producing the new. We must find a way to intervene in both, in their entwined totality that is capable of moving us forwards. By disregarding this tensile core of Fisher's dialectically psychedelic project, any posthumous acid communism is doomed to be little more than a folk politics. And if the contents of the first five lectures of this course are anything to go by, Fisher had much more in store for his readers than that. With this in mind, it is our hope that these lectures will be a useful resource, providing a broader foundation to the acid communism project than has previously been available. In many ways, it is astounding that an interest in acid communism has been stoked by so little. Uh, an unfinished introduction to... Um, uh, the book that uh, was published posthumously. Uh, this is a testament to the lucidity of Fisher's drafts, never mind his finished texts. Whilst the texts gathered here may similarly warrant the label of drafts, they nonetheless constitute something much more than an introduction. They are presented instead with the partial unravelling of an Ariadnean thread, and this is an unravelling we are all implored to continue in his absence. This may be an uncomfortable suggestion to some. It is undoubtedly Fisher's capability as a guide in this regard, his talents as a stalker even, traversing capitalism's weird and eerie zones that has led to the growing interest in his thought since his untimely death. Even those who are not familiar with his work before 2017 find themselves expressing the same sentiment that has been expressed online over and over again. I wish Mark Fisher was here to guide, to inform, to give us confidence, to give us a laugh. But in each instance, it is clear that the questions Fisher asked of uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard and Sleaford Mods remain pertinent to his own project, as well as those inspired by his legacy. Who will make contact with the anger and frustration he articulated? In addition, who will make contact with the joy and energy he created as well? The answers to these questions is not an it is not individual, is not an individual, but a collective. It was not Fisher himself, but a people yet to come. Thank you. Okay, I'll read the same section in German. Fischer selbst hatte nicht die Intention, seine Überlegungen in dieser Form zu publizieren. Da seine Werke inzwischen aber für alle möglichen Projekte herangezogen werden, gibt es wohl keine bessere Person, um seine Position klarzustellen als er selbst. Und diese Klärung ist auch sicherlich notwendig. Gegen Ende des Jahres 2017 versammelte sich unter dem Banner des Asset-Kommunismus in Großbritannien eine Fraktion der Soft Left mit direkten Verbindungen zur Labour Party und einem Versuch, einen wiedererstarkenden demokratischen Sozialismus durch eine ausgeprägte Hippie- und Rave-Nostalgie weiter zu unterfüttern. Sie gingen sogar so weit, für eine erneute Auseinandersetzung mit den Elementen der Hippie-Kultur zu werben, denen Fischer am meisten misstraute. Später gab man sich das Label Acid Corbinismus, um noch deutlicher Bezug auf die Tagespolitik zu nehmen. Zwar blieb diese Bewegung vielen von Fischers wichtigsten Zielen treu, wie etwa der Schaffung eines neuen kollektiven Bewusstseins, ihr hafteten aber auch viele der Eigenschaften an, in denen Fischer Hindernisse für die Entstehung einer neuen Gegenkultur sah. Letztlich ignorierte diese Bewegung die zentrale Problematik seines Gesamtwerks, die Krise des Negativen. Denn kollektiver Genuss ist ein oberflächlicher Trost für individualisierte Melancholie, wenn aus beidem nichts Neues erwächst. Wir müssen Wege finden, wie wir in beides intervenieren können, in ihre verstickte Totalität, denn nur so kommen wir voran. Jeder posthume asset kommunismus der dieses Spannungsverhältnis außer Acht lässt, das den Kern von Fischers dialektisch-psychedelischem Projekt bildet, ist dazu verurteilt, wenig mehr als volkstümliche Politik zu bleiben. Und nach den ersten fünf Vorträgen seines Seminars zu urteilen, hat der Fischer seiner Leserschaft sehr viel mehr zu bieten. In diesem Sinne ist es unsere Hoffnung, dass diese Vorträge eine nützliche Ressource bieten, um den Asset-Kommunismus auf eine neue Basis zu stellen, die bisher nicht verfügbar war. Es ist erstaunlich, dass das Interesse am Asset-Kommunismus auf so wenig und vor allem so unvollständigem Material gründet, was von der Klarheit von Fischers Entwürfen zeugt, um nicht von seinen fertigen Texten zu sprechen. 
Obwohl man die hier gesammelten Texte ebenfalls als Entwürfe bezeichnen könnte, bieten sie dennoch sehr viel mehr als eine Einführung. Vor uns liegt stattdessen ein teilweise entrollter Ariadnefaden und wir sind dazu eingeladen, ihn in Fischers Abwesenheit weiter zu entrollen. Vielleicht mögen manche von dieser Vorstellung irritiert sein. Es ist zweifelsohne Fischers Talent als Pfadfinder, vielleicht sogar als Nachsteller, in den seltsamen und unheimlichen Sohnen des Kapitalismus, das seit seinem Tod zu einem wachsenden Interesse an seinem Werk geführt hat. Selbst von denen, die sein Denken vor 2017 gar nicht kannten, hört man immer wieder dasselbe. Wäre doch nur Mark Fischer noch unter uns. Um uns, zu orienti um uns Orientierung zu bieten, uns zu informieren, uns Selbstvertrauen zu geben und uns zum Lachen zu bringen. Jedenfalls ist offensichtlich, dass die Fragen, die Fischer an Lyotard und die Lieford Mords stellte, für sein eigenes Projekt relevant bleiben, wie auch für alle, die sich von seinem Werk inspirieren haben lassen. Wer wird die Wut und die Frustration, die er, artik die er artikulierte, aufgreifen? Wer wird die Freude und Energie, die er zum Ausdruck brachte, ebenfalls neu hervorrufen? Dies, dies wird nicht durch ein Individuum, sondern kollektiv möglich sein. Fischer selbst wird dies nicht leisten können. Es bleibt eine Aufgabe für eine Bewegung, die es noch nicht gibt. Thank you. Um, I find it very on point when you say, um, maybe I'm speculating and you guys have another opinion, but I think it's very on point when you say that a lot of people think like, I wish Mark Fisher was here to develop uh, thinking and discussions about certain topics. I know for sure that in the, in the group that I'm active at, um, he is very constantly mentioned, which is quite brilliant if you are a writer and people actually put your thinking into practice um, in activism. Um, but before we talk about this, I actually would like to know how did Mark Fischer enter your life? Um, as a writer or a friend, I don't know the stories. Um, I would love to hear from you too. Um, yeah, uh, I was a, a long time reader of the K-Punk blog um, initially. Um, I had a blog myself for a very long time and still do. Um, um, but yeah, initially trained as a photographer. I don't know why now. Um, it felt like a good idea at the time. Um, and then just got more and more interested in Mark Fisher's work, but also of his colleagues, um, like Kojo Eschen. And when I discovered that both of them were teaching at Goldsmiths uh, <coughs> in London, I uh, decided to do a master's there. And then, yeah, met Mark Fisher in late 2016. And then the rest is unfortunately history. Um, that's kind of where these, the, that was the year that these lectures were given. Um, and yeah, so many different things happened. Yeah, um, I think the first time I heard of Mark was in 2014. I think that's when the uh, Vampire Castle essay yes. came out. Yeah, and actually I wasn't even particularly involved on the left at the time. I, I spent my 20s coding more or less so um <laughs> but it uh, uh, that that essay certainly made the rounds and um even reached me and yeah i mean it it sparked a huge debate on social media and so forth and um so yeah i read it and it it, it really spoke to me and um yeah ever since i've i've kind of known who mark fisher is and and he i was familiar more as peripherally with, with his work. And then, of course, we had this very cool opportunity at uh, Brumaire to translate this book. And um, I was asked if, if I wanted to do it. And it, yeah, it was a really cool opportunity. So I've gone, gotten to know Mark's work in a much more uh, yeah, intense way through this process of translating this book. Of course, it's you know, I, I wasn't properly familiar with him other than through some of his writings. And um, yeah, it's um, it was certainly um, eye-opening and there's no one really quite like him still. I, I think if, if, if people are aware, please let me know. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I certainly, um, I think I'm as fascinated by, by him and his writings as, as many other people are. Yeah, I think that's a great point, like this fascination. Like in my head, we're friends, 
And it's really <laughs> like really um, I was super excited to meet you because then I thought I would be making questions like how was he like in real life? <laughs> but because uh, I don't know if everyone has the, uh, took took a look at the book already, but it's like a transcripts from his last lectures and. Um, so um, there's like Studierende number 12 and then the sentence that this person said. Um, and I was uh, wondering if you were one of the students and you explained me a little bit the context. Yeah, um, I think the, and it's a fair assumption to say, ask which student I was, but I wasn't there. Um, not directly in the classroom. Um, the, the department, it was the visual cultures department that my, my Mark was working in at the time. And, and as is, I mean, it's it's so much worse now, but this kind of neoliberalization of the university and especially the humanities, um, this, this course that was called contemporary art theory was this strange amalgam of a bunch of much smaller courses. So as a student arriving there, you could choose from a dozen different modules uh, that you could do, you could pick two um, to do in the course of a year. And as much as I had actually gone to Goldsmiths to study under Mark, um, there was too much to choose from. So I didn't do his course. Um, I'd intended to audit it afterwards, or after Christmas actually, settle in. And then that wasn't possible. Um, and I was gutted about that and felt, was so disappointed. Um, but then I think I in, in wanting to kind of make up for that missed opportunity, ended up engaging so much more with Mark's work. Um, and yeah, my first book, at least in English, uh, was called Egress on Morning, Morning Melancholia, Mark Fisher. And it's a kind of, um, I guess the, 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 the popular term is auto theory at this point. It was, it was kind of a, a diary of 2017, the, the, the time after Mark's death um, and all that was happening um, politically in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and expanding on his thought um, and, re and seeing you know, all the places that it went and um, how it could be applied to the present. Um, that book came out in English uh, in March 2020, which was an interesting time in itself. Mm -hmm. um, it was a week before we locked down for the pandemic. Um, and it, and it, it was, uh, I think it had a mixed reception. Um, I think partly because the Mark Fisher that I described in the book wasn't that well known. Um, so a few li weeks later, I'd been sitting on these recordings from the lectures for a few years. They'd been shared around a lot. They were actually already online, um, but no one seemed to engage with them. And they felt so important that, yeah, in the first sort of coronavirus lockdown, I set about translate, uh, transcribing them all. Um, and yeah, and now we have this book that, um, no one expected to actually do very well. Um, it was going to be an ebook only. And then interest just grew and grew. And now it's been translated. Um, I think a Spanish translation has also just come out very recently. Um, and there's a Japanese translation. It's, yeah, it's, it's taken on a life of its own, which is very surprising, but also speaks to the increasing posthumous popularity of Mark's work. That's very nice to hear that uh, so many translations are, are coming out. And I'm also happy to hear that the book has had ha, ha, is having so many re-editions because while I was reading it, I also like had a strong feeling that it was a like an important healing process to transcribe it and then to put it out there. And um, on that note, I would like to know more about the topics that Fisher brings in the book related to the times in which he was preparing those lectures. Um, for example, why do you think he was thinking about desire and post-capitalism in 2016? Um, I think especially in the UK, um, there were so many questions around what kind of future <laughs> do we want? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true in general. I mean, you know, 2016 is, was the, the, the main sort of thing hanging over that time was the, uh, it was just before Trump was elected. Um, 
So those few months before Mark's death, that was all anybody was talking about. Um, the, the, the possibility, or what seemed at the time the impossibility that that could happen. But also 2016 was the, <laughs> the Brexit referendum. Um, so there was a lot of, the atmosphere was just like, why are we, why are we going after? Why are we voting for just these quite sad things really? And I think Mark says in the lectures themselves, he doesn't reference Deleuze and Guattari, but um, they're the kind of spectre that hangs over the course for him. And I think it's there's a, the, their line from Anti-Oedipus, um, the question that um, Wilhelm Wright uh, puts together or something, the one that Spinoza knew so well. Um, I'm paraphrasing terribly. Um, but yeah, why do we fight for our servitude as if it were our freedom? something like that. Um, that being their central question of desire and its relationship to capitalism. Um, and I think for Mark, um, who was so inspired by their work specifically, those questions had become in increasingly more pertinent um, at a time when, yeah, it seemed everybody was, you know, it was, it was turkeys voting for Christmas sort of feeling. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's very interesting that you bring this idea of futurity because um, combined with the mental health topics that were so important to him and to his writing, and if you're struggling with depression or whatever it is, you have really a hard time already visualizing the possibility of building a future, even though the context outside can be great, but it doesn't matter when you're facing mental health issues. But then it's not only this mental landscape that is going on is everything else that is like more or less falling apart. And I think he translated this this mindset very well. But um like as an like I'm I also as an educator myself I always think like when I'm invited to give like creative writings, workshops or whatever, the last thing I think about is poetry and more like how can I bring the current topics of society to a classroom so that people discuss those topics through poetry or literature or whatever. And I was wondering, like, how do you think that for him this process of translating what is happening out there to the classroom, to the process of teaching, how do you think it was uh, his process or how did you um, experience while transcribing the text, um, the audio? Yeah, um, there is, there is, uh, it's probably an unfortunate metaphor, but it's it's kind of apt and not to sort of label as a diagnosis, but there's a there's a bipolarity to Mark's thought. There is this deep melancholia, this great frustration and hatred of the present, but also a lot of joy and there was a um there's one of the his final lengthy blog posts um in one of the general election campaigns in the UK. Um it was called Abandon Hope, Summer is Coming. Um, I think it was a play on the, trying to invert the Game of Thrones, Winter is Coming thing, something like that. Um, but Mark has this thing, he had this thing there that you know there's all this talk of political hope, but what we really need is confidence. Um, and that was very much, I think, what he really did bring to the classroom. Um, he kind of, the. Um, and, and I hope it's something that does come across in the transcription. It was kind of the most interesting part of doing it, was trying to kind of capture the, 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 uh, the inflections, the, the, the atmosphere in the room beyond just Mark's words. Um, because there was even then, I mean, I remember seeing, I'm still kind of haunted by seeing Mark a few weeks before he died. And outside of the classroom, he was kind of a bit of a shell. He was very, very just like the, there was a dark cloud over him. But then in the in the classroom, the completely the opposite. Um, he had this confidence and hope that, um, yeah, better things weren't just. I think it wasn't just that better things are possible; they're already here. They're unfolding. Um, and what you know, what strategies, what tactics can be used to, well, accelerate those processes, um, which is something that, yeah, comes into the lectures too, I think. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a, but it's a, um, 
it's a tension in his work that I think is kind of had an impact on. Um, I, I always think of there's um, Tom York from Radiohead. There was a he was interviewed for the BBC years ago, and he has this comment about going to see a Mark Rothko exhibition in the Tate, and uh, he sort of says he notices that he he looks at the adults that are walking around the gallery and taking in the paintings, and all they see is a man that killed himself. But then you watch the children that are in that exhibition and all they see are the bright colors and the paintings and things. And I think that Mark's works had a very similar reception. People now only see him as this man who committed suicide, but they miss the color and the vibrancy that's very much there. Wow, that's a really nice way to describe. I didn't know this uh, Tom York interview, but wh as I was reading, I, was, was, I had the feeling that I was listening to someone who really had the love for teaching. And I was more or less surprised that he doesn't mention Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, at any moment, because it's very there, the love for the students and how he takes the students seriously, but also how he ap appears to be enjoying sharing this knowledge with the students so that you know people get inspired through keep living, to keep living, even though you know everything looks so bad. Um, well, that was that was one thing too that I forgot to mention please. that does summarize that point because it was the the title of the introduction is no more miserable Monday mornings and there was a that was a mix tape that Mark a mix that Mark had made and put on the K-punk blog um, without any fanfare just a, a, an mp3 and a track list but in private he would it was Monday mornings were when his class was scheduled um, and I think that was particularly significant for him. Monday morning being kind of um, so associated with the beginning of the working week and the drudgery and everybody gets the Sunday sads maybe or something before you start the nine to five. Um, for Mark, that changed at that point. Um, and teaching was, was his favorite thing, I think, at that time. Yeah, it's very f feelable if this word exists, but talking about work, I would love to hear from Alex <laughs> about a little bit about the translation process. Um, um, one thing that I'm curious about is especially the title. Um, I'm not a native German speaker, but what I do know about German language is that it has so many words for one thing. So why not, like, okay, post-capitalism desire, it could have been begehren, it could have been lust, could have been post-capitalism, but then you chose nach dem capitalism, nach dem capitalismus, yes. Can you share with us a little bit about it? Sure, yeah. Um, the title is something we came up with in a long meeting at the Jacobin offices, and I, I forget whose idea it was. I don't think it was mine, but I can't quite, I, um, I apologize to whoever came up with it. But of course, I mean, um, I, I to any German speakers, I don't need to explain this, but it um, it, it works on two levels. It's it's um, your desire, uh, the, the post-capitalist desire, like like the English title, but also the desire um, that you have for capitalism. And um, in terms of what it was like to work on the book, it's I. Um, yeah, it's it's not an easy text uh, for for a translator, at least not for me, um, because it's it's very dense and very theoretical, and there's a lot of ideas, and and Mark jumps around a lot, and he makes all these connections that that you don't expect. Um, but then at the same time, it's very conversational, and um, that's um, sometimes uh, yeah challenging to put these two things together, particularly in German. And um, it's yeah, but but you really you know you you work yourself your way through it, and then um, after you know two or three passes, you you get it to a point where you think, okay, I th I think this is more or less what would have happened in a at a German university if Mark Fisher was German and lecturing in German. That's kind of the goal. But um, of course, there's there's always like difficult choices you have to make, like in 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 any translation, and some things you can't really do justice to. But it was definitely also um, 
he talks about the idea of consciousness raising a lot in the book, and I think it was somewhat of an experience of consciousness raising to translate the book, mm -hmm. because um, if you spend that much time with a text, you you start to think about it in different ways. And for me, certainly, there were things um, also politically um, that that came together in a new way, and 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 I started to think of, of things differently. And I hope that readers will have the same same sort of experience with the book. It's nice that you that you mentioned the consciousness raising thing because I was really moved to see him talking about it and taking it seriously because more often than not this is something that happened that was very important for feminist movements that informed other groups also in their activism in the fight for justice and that it's often ridicule, there's something that is like, oh, people just sit in a room and talk and talk about how their husbands beat them. And it's so much more than that and so much more influential. So I was really happy to to see that being, like that he took two chapters of the book to not only talk about the history of this, but the power of, um, of this practice. I didn't read the German translation. Can you tell us how you translate consciousness raising? <laughs> Bewusstseinsbildung. Bewusstsein, Sensbildung. Bildung. Danke schön. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, while and then while I was reading the English version, Alex, um, like getting this feeling that Mark Fisher was on a mission to make his students get active and to you know like to to participate in transformative actions. And there is this this feeling throughout that is really impossible to translate. So I was wondering, like, where were the moments that you were like, oh my God, I cannot do this? Or that you know that you had to spend more time focused on, was there a more complicated chapter? Like the Leotard chapter, <laughs> was that was a tough one. Yeah, I would like to hear from you about the uh, not so fun parts of the work. Uh, yeah, that leotard is, uh, that took up a lot of time, um, and kind of a an exacerbating factor was that it's uh, I I couldn't get hold of a PDF of of leotard in German, so I had to look it up in, in the printed edition, uh, which uh, you know took took some time, but um, no, it, it's it's really more um, I think. Trying to do justice to to the personality of Mark Fisher, he's very very good with the students, very diplomatic, very accommodating. It's it's sometimes not that easy to be this diplomatic in German, but um, <laughs> I, I tried my best. Um, but you 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 can really you you get the feeling how much he loved. How much how much he loved teaching and how much he loved his students and I tried to you know convey that in a text and um, you know here or there there's funny moments and and you know it's you also try to be genuine to I'm sure you to the recording and and I to to the English text there's sometimes you know he trails off and then he doesn't quite finish what he started and you you have to convey it in an authentic way, but um, I think that, that that was sort of the most um, the most challenging um, aspect overall. Just it's, you know, it's it's not your usual kind of academic text, it's not journalism, it's not, um, yeah, it's not a novel, so it's it, it has its unique challenges, I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, would you like to, I'm um, just like keep going on. Would you like to comment on something or for each other? I also have questions. <laughs> I, can, I can keep going. Um, uh, well, you put me on the spot now. No, I mean, it, <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's fascinating for me to hear too. Um, uh, because yeah, I mean, it's the, it, uh, it, the, yeah, the trend, I mean, it was a few years ago now for me, it was nearly four years ago of actually transcribing the thing, but um, yeah, it's a very particular process, and so I'd like to formally apologise for, <laughs> for for the for the for the nightmare that it can be at times. It was a, it was a nightmare to listen to as well, um, but worth it, I think, very much so. How long did it take to transcribe? Oh God, the, um, the lectures in 
the five lectures uh, were about two hours each. So <laughs> it would take 10 hours to listen through. I think it, well, it, it was also, it, it's, it's important maybe to know, I, I, I very much hope it doesn't come through in, in the text in either version. Um, but this was my, um, some people took up baking in lockdown. I did this um, uh, when time was not real, and um, I actually couldn't tell you how long it took. Um, probably about six months. Um, but yeah, I'd all but lost my mind by that point, I think. <laughs> yeah, there were moments like that during the translation. Where I felt similarly, <laughs> and it, it, it took a long time. For it's, it's not an easy text, uh, I think we... We can agree on that. Yes. Um, what I would like to is to go a little bit, dive a little bit more in the in the content uh, in this invitation that Max did to his students to, you know, join some type of transformative action and mm. be loving and trust the process, even though everything feels shitty. <laughs> um, like, what do you think, Matt, that the things that Mark Fisher taught us in general, but with this book in particular, that uh, we could uh, apply in real life in like eight years later? Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, I think what's most important for me about even putting this book together is that it shows, as. Uh, as, as sad as it is that it's unfinished, I think it's so important that this is Mark developing a positive project um, in the sense of, um, well, as Alex mentioned, I mean, capitalist realism is still probably his best known work that is fundamentally a critique, um, quite obviously. Um, even exiting the vampire castle, which was so controversial at the time when it was released, um, uh, yeah, in English, um, um, and I think partly because for many people that that cr that cr that critique that particular critique went too far, um, and Mark was was I think had a a pretty bad time after it was published. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a kind of, I think it's important that you mention how much time he spends with consciousness raising, um, because and, and this is something I wrote an essay about this for a newspaper back home last year when the revelations came out about Russell Brand, because Mark kind of, uh, in the Exiting the Vampire Castle, talks about Russell Brand in very positive terms, which is very unfortunate. Um, and I think it was at the time. Um, people were already very aware of, of Brand's sort of sexism. And what Mark saw in him is, yeah, it's debatable of how, well, that was the debate, of, of how useful is a figure like that um, having someone so popular who was nonetheless being was on UK television a lot talking about radical ideas um, how useful was it that it was Russell Brand anyway um, the main thing that I think Mark came that the main critique I think that hurt Mark the most after that essay was that a lot a lot of people dismissed him as an anti-feminist um, that in in this text being sort of a a, a very um, uh, trying to describe and critique what many people would now call cancel culture. Um, that yeah, m this was Mark writing a reactionary essay in the early years of the culture war, um, and uh, it's an essay that I've yeah I've got very mixed feelings about for that reason. Um, I think it, it it does do Mark's thought in general a disservice. That being said, I think this project. It goes beyond the critique. Um, it shows that if that's a kind of diagnosis, rather than being so negative, and, th and I guess from the part of the introduction that I read, this, um, I think it's something from Alain Badiou, when he talks about the crisis of the negative, we are, as a, as a uh, culturally and as a society maybe, or whatever, um, we're very good at destroying the old but not producing the new, was Badiou's argument. And I think Mark had realized at a certain point that he was kind of being guilty of that too. He was ve he'd become very well known for you know, attempts to pull down the ideological scaffolding of our present moment, but what was he offering up that was more positive? And I think this text is an attempt to do that, that nonetheless, 
um, which accounts for its difficulty, I think. Um, it's This isn't Mark simply saying, if we're all happy and love one another, everything will be fine. Um, he acknowledges that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but he uh, he stays with the trouble, as it is, as it were. Um, and I think, again, it's yeah, it's sad that it's that it's kind of cut off. It was meant to be a fifteen-week course. We get five of those lectures, um, but there there is a momentum here anyway. I think for yeah, building that positive project and staying with the difficulties that are involved in building a positive leftist project. Yeah, um, I, I can definitely uh, I agree with all of that. He he doesn't let you get away with your bullshit. Like he really, really challenges you. And um, you know, he goes where it hurts and uh, he asks really tough questions and of, of any reader, I think. And um, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's what, what was so fascinating, reading the book several times over, translating it. Um, that you know these questions they start to started to work on me as well and and I hope it it will be the same for readers and yeah um, but I think if from my perspective even though it's it's of course the, the it's not the whole course it's it's incomplete but I think he gets close to a very fair and thorough analysis and um, yeah um, post-mortem of the counter-cultural model of doing politics and I think it's um, the assessment that he offers I think is is very fair and um, he talks about the successes and the failures of the counterculture and of doing politics through counterculture and um, I think he, you know, throughout the text it becomes clear, okay, here's, here's what we have to work on, here's what we have to develop further. Um, because, um, yeah, I mean, in right now, you know, like we're in a situation, I think, on the left where um, we can't change mainstream culture. We, we don't have the numbers, we don't, we're not strong enough. Um, but doing politics through counterculture doesn't seem to really work that well either. We, it, it, the model seems to have its limitations and it seems to have run its course um, years ago, probably decades ago. And um, it's of course it's not a blueprint for what else we could do, but I think there's a lot of good ideas in, in, in the text. And um, yeah, that's that's what I took from it. Which good ideas? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, if, and I think this is the role that the Leotard chapter plays in the book. Um, I think he Mark lays out a very convincing case for, um, of course, uh, leftist politics uh, has to be a cultural politics. There's no such thing as like a purely material politics. Um, yeah, uh, nobody believes that. Um, n not even the good people at Jacobin. Um, but um, you know, the question is, is: is how do you achieve that? Like, if if you want a different kind of society, if um, you know, you you need to change people's political consciousness. But what is the the process to do so? And um, I think if if we can't do it through just brute force in mainstream culture and we can't do it through the counterculture, um, then the question is, okay, we, we somehow have to do it in our own space but in mainstream culture at the same time. And um, I think the answer that I took from the book is that um, we have to work in, in institutions um, that uh, lo are located within mainstream culture that are open to pretty much everyone and everyone and ev anybody, but um, that um, develop an internal culture that is not defined as as being, you know, 
a rejection of mainstream culture, but that, that opens up a space where consciousness can develop and where can mainstream culture can change within our leftist spaces. Um, because, um, you know, he, he talks about experiences that people had with, you know, with living in communes and so forth. And yeah, I mean, he, he references the, um, uh, the Adam Curtis documentary. I, I forgot which one it is, but um, I think it's, um, I forgot, I think it's All Loved Over by Machines of, uh, All Looked Over by Machines of Loving Grace. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a very kind of unvarnished look at, at what it was like back then, at, at what the culture um, achieved, but also at, at its shortcomings. And a lot of these projects it turned a little bit into a shit show. I mean, it, if we talk about regressive gender politics today, which is, you know, a huge issue for the right and something that they really mobilize uh, around, you know, the real trad wives were living in communes back then. So um, I think it's, he really challenges you to think about these issues very sincerely and very deeply. And um, yeah, I think that's that's what we need for, for a left that can be successful again and can win again. I think we need a, a different mode of doing cultural politics that is, um, that is realistic, that, that, that we can actually achieve, um, but that doesn't, um, yeah, that, that sort of um, doesn't repeat the mistakes of the counterculture and, and its, um, its shortcomings. But I don't know, maybe you disagree. Um, no, I do, I do agree. Um, I, I think one of Mark's most important concepts, I think, that's maybe lesser known. Um, but he would often talk on the blog about um, a sense of a popular modernism. Popular, popular modernism. Um, which he... Popular modernism. Modernism, okay. Yeah. Um, which he would define for, for Mark uh, when he was growing up um, effectively as like a post-punk, I suppose, in the, in the late 70s and probably more in the 80s, um, probably a bit too young in the 70s. Um, but in the 80s, yes, and he would write on the blog about bands like The Jam, who were, you know, having hit singles, were exceedingly popular, maybe even mainstream, but had songs that were communicating and, yeah, raising consciousness. Um, and that was partly, I think, the argument in Mark's Exiting the Vampire Castle essay. Um, the the problem the prevailing problem that people had with figures like Russell Brand or um, the UK journalist Owen Jones um, was they were always accused of selling out um, and I guess people have heard that plenty of times before I always think of I always associate it in my head with like Kurt Cobain um, when a counterculture or a subculture a subcultural aesthetics makes contact with the mainstream it's all but null and void. Um, and Mark's argument, I think, especially in that essay, is that um, if we are going to, if we if we don't want to back a particular individual um, that's been produced and kind of elevated by capitalism, if we want to wait for a cultural messaging that emerges outside of capitalism, we're going to be waiting a very long time. Yeah. Um, and I think that, but the problem then is that you know what the the uh, our mainstream culture industries also are very good at chewing up these people um uh the mark edited mark's first well not quite his first book um i guess it kind of is mark's first book before capitalist realism which he edited for zero books was a book about michael jackson um he had plans to do something else um later on uh, according to Kojo Eshin, his, uh, who he shared an office with at Goldsmiths, they wanted to do an edited collection together called Kanye Theory. Um, uh, I guess Russell Brand's another figure. Something um, about aging badly. Russell. Yes, <laughs> well, exactly. That's precisely my point, though, in a way. Yeah. It's like the, the, um, the, the, there is this... I mean, how do you explain 
a figure like Kanye West than you know someone going from um, uh, I think a, a very significant and very important politicizing voice in popular culture to then yeah insanity um, and and being kind of just reprehensible and I think part of that I mean th this is maybe a pet theory but it's I don't understand how anybody can be that kind of stature of celebrity and still keep all of their marbles as it were um, and that's a problem that's a, that's a problem for cultural politics um, and I think that was partly what Mark was interested in how do you walk that line um, between retaining some kind of you know subcultural countercultural critiques of the mainstream whilst being able to um, proliferate your message enough that it actually has an impact on what it's critiquing, if that makes sense. Um, I think that's, it's it's not a question, well, it partly is a question that Mark would ask in various different places, particularly towards the end of his life. Um, I've got a lot else on my plate and it probably won't be me anyway, but there is another book of essays that I think should be done from around this time. Um, there's a, I mean, I guess we're, we're kind of talking about and it's actually what's so nice to be doing this event here. I, I arrived early and went to go see Herbert Marcuse next door. Um, and one of the lectures is Mark talking about Herbert Marcuse and Ellen Willis. And he has an essay that I'd recommend to people um, that is online. And um, it was published by Eflux. And it's called, um, it's a quote from Ellen Willis. Uh, it's a, a social and psychic revolution of almost inconceivable magnitude, colon, popular cultures interrupted accelerationist dreams. Um, and that's basically Mark, maybe the, you know, the chapter that would have been in acid communism, but, but talking about those same ideas and precisely yeah, that, that, that disappointment. Ellen, I mean, Marcuse is someone who's writing kind of at the beginning of the counterculture is so inspirational for it. Ellen Willis, who's writing after its dreams have kind of died. And I think Mark, very consciously, no pun intended, um, wanted to hold both of those sort of temporalities together. Um, how do we hold both of those things, not just the idea of um, cultural artifacts that are that uh, we might think of as prefiguring a kind of cultural revolution or and be something not in grand of those terms, but you know, it's a, a better world. Um, and the things that are also being produced now that mourn what we've lost. Um, and I think in a way that's partly, for me anyway, that's kind of that defining structure of feeling for modernism to always, so that, uh, that make it new um, mantra that comes with a melancholy from, you know, the, of, uh, um, of what has supposedly been lost but that's the kind of perfect mixture and that's everywhere. We're just kind of maybe not finding a way to really make that tension as productive as it could be. I think one of the good tricks to make this mixture not as effective as it could be, and that's something that Max talks about in the book, is uh, the role of the, res the like resentment as a feeling that is induced by the reactionaries, but also this resentment with those who get to power or to cultural um, um, recognizement. And I wanted to, um, we don't have much time left, but I would like to start like um, going to, to, uh, to the end of our, of our talk today and then maybe have time for one or two questions. Um, there's a song from Beyonce that I think it's quite genius to, and reflects what Mark Fisher has described as resentment as a tool of dividing the working class. In the song, Beyonce is talking to Jay-Z and um, she's talking to actually, let me remember, I think she's talking to the, yeah, she's talking to him, to Jay-Z. It's from her second album and she says something like, how you dare give her what you should have given to me, which is how resentment works. Um, when you look like other people getting things or getting um, recognizement for what they do, uh, you know, just recently there is um, there was this post from the Links Partei in which they are saying, "Oh, now selbstbestimmung gesetz, we made it," and then the comments are like, 
well, don't you care about the workers? And it's like, yeah, trans people work too. I don't know if you're aware, uh, you know. Anyway, so um, before we open to the questions of the audience, uh, I would love to hear more about this, like, this game that he makes between identifying resentment as a very smart tool and then bringing optimism as a response to it. Dua Lipa's new album is called Radical Optimism. <laughs> so bear in mind, things are changing maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can have a go. Um, so, resentment is, is really, it pops up almost all across the book um, in, in, in various places. And um, yeah, I think it's, um, if, if you look at what's going on on the right today and how we're frankly not doing a very good job at countering it, um, it's 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 a huge problem. Um, of course, like um, if you want to offer up a class politics as as you know as your politics on the left, and also not just as an answer to the right, but it 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 should play that role as well. Um, you know, resentment is 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 can be a component of that. I think. Um, but uh, I think what's clear f that for Mark, and, and I would totally agree with that, it's that it has to be more. So resentment can play a role on the left. I, I wouldn't disavow resentment, but um, you have to, you can't stop there. You have to, as you said, offer up a positive project. And um, I think the argument that, that he makes for why that's the case um, in, in, in the text is very strong because if you, if you just offer resentment, even from the left, mm, it collapses in on itself. And um, I think, yeah, there's plenty places and times where that mistake has been made and we shouldn't repeat it. Um. Yeah, and I think the and I think the Beyonce example is good. There's also another one that Mark does write about himself, not Beyonce, but Destiny's Child. And he's got a post about their song "Bills, Bills, Bills." Um, they keep coming. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, and that that song, I mean, Mark has a really interesting take on it because I think it's a song. It's kind of about like this. The it's it's that classic kind of Destiny's Child like female empowerment, kind of what we'd call now girl bossing or whatever. Um, it's like, I'm making all this money. Um, I'm the breadwinner now. That's great for me. Why are you, you know, this layabout boyfriend who's not doing enough, like, I don't want to be paying for all of your things. And um, But Mark has this take that rather than that being this, like, purely just parroting this kind of neoliberal um, sentiment, um, you kind of have to consider the other side too, that there is this, the, the, uh, and it's that, that, that um, process of consciousness raising. Um, it's significant that it's in a pop song um, because as much as it could be one person singing about their individual partner, um, I guess that process of consciousness raising is when you have an individualized resentment and you have your own feelings and then you talk to someone else and it's like, oh, I'm going through the same thing. And then suddenly, that feel, in that feeling being shared, it's no longer individual and it becomes structural. It's not just the layabout boyfriend's fault, it's patriarchy um, or whatever. Um, and understanding that structural, um, uh, yeah, those structures is, in, is integral to that consciousness raising process. Um, and I think, yeah, that's what Mark really does pull towards in, yeah, talking about resentment. It's it's a kind of, it's a seed. Um, you can feel it in yourself individually, but then what do you do with that? How do you join that with other people's experiences and feelings? Um, and I think partly, yeah, he, him wanting to counter the fact that um, it, it, it's, it, 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 that's not that radical of a process. We kind of do it all of the time. Um, and that's exciting. Um, it's you know it, it's a, a part of this same. And it's the, what Mark talks about in the um, his essay on Marcuse and Ellen Willis. Um, it, it seems what the hardest thing right now seems to be to retain 
this understanding from the 60s and 70s um, of this kind of second wave feminism that's completely rethinking, um, particularly like structures of the family and things like this. Um, what's strange just looking back on that now is their confidence, not only that these things were possible, but they were already unfolding and emerging. Um, and I think it's that in particular that Mark wanted to kind of reiterate. Um, we're not entirely closed off from this politics that we have. It's not all wishful thinking. Um, we have the tools for it right here already. There are pockets of it, um, pockets of these other ways of life developing. Um, that's why a collective consciousness raising is so important. You need to join up the dots. Um. That's beautiful. That's a really nice way to, to put the book. As I was reading the book, it reminded me a lot, a lot of the things that he spoke as like examples of how we could live with culture and culture as a transformative process reminded me a lot of the landless workers movement in Brazil. They're the biggest movement in Latin America and they use culture in such a like informed and um, in a powerful way also, not only that uh, their, their members consume cultural things, but also that they're encouraged to produce it and they, you know, they make it everything possible that it gets mainstream, that it gets out there. You know, if you are a writer or if you're a musician and you're involved in the landless workers movement, like they do everything they can so that it gets famous. And it's not uh, this like, oh my God, we're famous now, we shouldn't do it because we're leftists. So yeah, it's happening already. As you say, it happens all the time, actually. Um, but I don't want to give the final word. Maybe people have questions. I think we would have time for like two. Um, and then um, we, oh, fancy. And you guys get a microphone even. There's one hand there. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the um, interesting uh, conversation. Um, uh, I have um, a question. Um, I, I want, would like to, um, you, you said something about we don't need hope, we need uh, confidence. Uh, I find this very interesting, um, uh, maybe a bit uh, in, in conflict uh, to what uh, was uh, said uh, in other places uh, today. Um, but uh, um, because I think a big problem in the German left is that um, we do not want to get, uh, we do not want to go where it hurts. <laughs> this is uh, a big problem, and uh, sorry, but also with Jacobin, <laughs> a bit. Um, but um, yeah, um, I would like. Um, I'm, I'm very fascinated about the, uh, fascinated about the myth of the uh, fool um, as a revealing character, um, which you can see, for instance, in this um, adoption of Bartleby in for by Shijek, even though Shijek doesn't uh, interpret him very well, <laughs> um, or in the uh, figure or figurehead of um, Diogenes. So, um, what do you think about uh, something like that? It's not really a positive vision, but it is a confident uh, vision as a critique in the here and now, more like a punk uh, <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, yeah, the 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 Bartleby. I would prefer not to. Yes. Um, yes. That kind of. I think yeah, there is a co it's a confident refusal, right? A refusal to kind of engage. Um, and I, he I hear your point. I think that's a it's a problem for the left everywhere. That well, not even just the left. I think it's a sort of you, you made me think of that line from David Hume. Um, what does he say? Something like, "It is preferable to, or no, what was it? Um, it is natural to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of your finger." Um, uh, which which there's, there's maybe there's possibly a nice tying in with Marx, the end of the world is easy to imagine and the end of capitalism sort of thing. Um, it's a similar sort of logic where, um, yeah, we, if, if, if we were better at dealing with the difficulties um, collectively, yeah, the, the, we would probably be more willing to, yeah, that's kind of the gambit, right? The, the, why is it easier to imagine the end of not just the world but the end of life 
um, as we're kind of you know in in the midst of a of a climate emergency that that we would prefer to just deal with the problems that are coming rather than get to the cause of them. Um, I think that's it's it's not even just a problem of the left, and I think maybe there's partly the there's a there's a there's a problem with that melancholia that a lot of these problems are made specific to the left. I think in a lot of ways, they're kind of just broadly human faults. Um, and maybe there's a, there's a case of thinking, um, you know, with this kind of a, a, a certain sense of humanism or something that um, we should be better than that. Um, I think that's partly what Mark gets at in, 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 the, in the book, in the final lecture on Leotard, as, as difficult as it is. Um, we're kind of, we're wired in, a, in unfortunate ways. Um, but a lot of what Mark was writing on long prior to his most famous books, um, when he was at the, doing his PhD and a member of the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, it was all of this talk about, um, um, he has a blog post called Emotional Engineering, um, uh, th always this, uh, this kind of Spinozist outlook of, um, we can, uh, there are multiple ways in which we can change our thinking in that regard. Um, uh, it, maybe there's a point to be made of um, to say that we need to deal with our own problems doesn't necessarily have to be like some kind of exposure therapy or I don't know like we all need to sit on the couch and and talk about our you know d our, our unfortunate ways of thinking. Um, there's not a kind of cognitive behavioral therapeutic element to it. There are many other ways that we can change our thinking, and we do. Again, we do it all of the time. Um, and I guess, yeah, and I think that's partly this this issue of confidence. There's the, rather than the hope that things can get better, it's the, the the confidence is important. In that sense, again, I would prefer not to that 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 desire to refuse um, is also there. This as alongside these desires for all the things that capitalism gives us, like you know, the Mark talks in the first lecture about you're allowed to want a system other than capitalism and still go to Starbucks. I mean, um, that, that, that's not going to be the thing that breaks, you know, that's not a contradiction that's going to break everything down. Um, you have to think bigger than that um, and understand that, yeah, you do think in terms that are like a, you know, fuck Starbucks whilst being in the queue or whatever. You can hold those two things together. The fact that one exists that is imagining something else, that's enough Maybe, maybe it's not enough, but it's a starting point, and the fact it's already there is something to build on. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's 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 not just that things are things aren't hopeless. Um, there's a lot to work with already. Thank you, Matt. So, can we take a second question? Yes, and then that's it. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for having me as a question. Um, yeah, I read the English uh, book, Post-Capitalist Desire, and so we already mentioned um, consciousness raising and sort of traces of the counterculture that sort of go th through until the mainstream in music. And I was just thinking about movies, and I know that Mark Fisher in like the first or the second lecture I uh, mentioned this text by uh, Gibson Graham that has um, the full Monty. And yeah, I was just thinking if you could think of any like pop culturally significant movies, maybe also more recent ones that were coming out after Mark Fisher died that sort of fit into this post-capitalist framework, let's say. Oh. That's a very good. Um, oh, that's a very good question, and now um, that's going to be hard. Um, th I have some in mind, and I'm forgetting. I put my phone somewhere. I can't even Google it on stage. Um, oh, what's the guy's name? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I currently live in in Newcastle upon Tyne, in the northeast of England, and this is kind of just me sketching a geography, uh, um, like a map maybe to finding who this person is. It's going to really bug me. Um, anyway, um, there are a lot of narratives from that region. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite heavily deprived region. Um, 
but another film that could be added to Mark's list of a similar sort of time is this film Billy Elliot. Um, I don't know if anyone else is, is, is how popular it is outside the UK. It's really popular in the UK and has been for years. It's almost a classic at this point. Um, it's about a young boy from Newcastle who is uh, uh, his his dad wants him to be a man's man. His dad's on is a, a, a striking miner. Um, and is putting pressure on his kids to you know find jobs and stuff. And his son wants to be a ballerina. He wants to dance. And um, it's sort of this really nice tale of of I guess there's like a conflict there of the, 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 it's there's a sort of um, class mobility, sort of escaping his class narrative, but also of 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 how this this sense that uh, within the 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 conflict and the and and the the tumult of the minor strikes the this young gay boy who wants to be a dancer, um, something from another world, a desire from another world, actually is easier to accept in a way because of how much else is changing. Um, there's a few like that that also in Newcastle. Um, one film I can think of is called I, Daniel Blake. I can't remember that. Ken Loach. Ken Loach's films, especially his most recent ones, I think, um, have a very similar... Um, uh, kind of, yeah, that sort of social realist, <laughs> realist being an interesting word in the context of Mark Fisher, um, but that kind of approach that um, have been um, genuinely politically significant, I think, in the UK, um, because they've they've uh, you know, it's this 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 realist approach that actually does highlight you know using kind of non-professional actors and things that. Um, has greatly raised awareness of a plight that is continuing. Um, though I feel like they're all quite wholesome and very rooted in reality. I feel like for Mark as a kind of cyberpunk, there would have to be like some, I'm trying to think of post-capitalist sci-fi now. Can I give a suggestion? Yes, please. There was a film, I'm gonna talk about Brazil again, I'm sorry. There's a film called Bacurau from Kleber Mendonça Filho, I don't know if you watched it. It's it's set in a small city in the northeast Brazil, and it's uh, you know it's a sci-fi punkish thing without professional actors. It's a mini 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 city that at one day dis disappears from the map from Google Maps, and then a bunch of Americans and one German come <laughs> to destroy the city. They were gonna play like video games live with the human beings. Spoiler, I'm sorry. They organize against and they win. But it's very absurd, everything that happens. Um, so, recommend that. Now, please. Do you have any? Yeah, I'm... Um, it's... Uh, I just, I'm, I'm stuck on the point that uh, we, we just, uh, in Germany, we've, we're falling so dreadfully short of anything like that. Um, so I, uh, those are good recommendations. I I go with them and like, yeah. yeah Billy Elliot was quite great. Yeah. Yeah. Did you remember the film that you the, were trying to remember? Oh well, just Ken Loach. Um, ah, Ken okay. Loach I has been. You wanted to say another sorry, no, it was the director. No. I couldn't remember okay. Ken Loach's name, but yeah, he's he's been very prolific the past ten years. Um, and yeah, his his films are amazing. Um, he is great. Very yeah. difficult watches though. There's. But yeah, the uh, uh, harrowing depictions of contemporary life in contemporary working class life in the northeast of England. But he still manages to yeah bring a, a hope and a confidence to them, despite also showing the harsh reality that yeah our government wants to ignore. With a lot of love too, I would yes, say for yeah, his definitely. characters. I hope you have uh, take notes. You have a lot of movies to watch. Um, that's it. We still can hang out and you still can ask questions to Matt and Alex. Thank you all for coming. If you didn't buy it yet or want to read, um, wait. shop.jacobin.de slash busha. B-U-E-T-H-E-R. It's a note for myself. Thank you everyone for coming. Have fun and annoy the guests <laughs> afterwards. Thank you.